For tonight's debates, we have very strict rules in place. To protect our staff, to protect the candidates on stage, we're making sure that all of our crew has masks and everyone coming in the door has to show proof of vaccination. To make this night possible, as unusual as it may be, we relied on a number of our community partners, closest of which, of course, is the Somerville Chamber of Commerce helping us produce this event. Thank you to the Somerville Theater and the Freeman family for this beautiful space we're in tonight. And of course, for you watching at home. I hope you vote and let's go watch the debate. Hello, I'm Steve Brown from WBUR here at the historic Somerville Theater. I'm your host for tonight's debate produced by the Somerville Media Center and sponsored by the Somerville Chamber of Commerce. I'll have with me tonight Councillor Will Umbach and Councillor Katiana Valentine, the first and second place finishers for the mayoral race in Somerville. Both will be on the ballot November 2nd. Tonight's debate will have two major parts. I have questions for the two candidates on subjects that have been sent to their campaigns. Candidates will have a minute to answer, and both the candidates and I will have our timekeeper in sight just off stage. In the second round, candidates will ask questions of each other with 30 seconds for the question and one minute for the answer. Candidates will be allowed both opening and closing statements of two minutes each. So we will get underway. Your opening statement today will be with Katya. Hi, I'm Katiana Valentine. I'm running for mayor of Somerville. I'm optimistic about our future because I know from experience in Somerville, when we work together, we can accomplish anything. Our next mayor must have three key qualities. She must embody the cultures and values of Somerville. She must have an inclusive leadership style, and she must have the skills and experience to be chief executive. I best bring those three key qualities to the mayor's office. I was born and orphaned in Greece, adopted there by my Scottish father and Czech German mother. We are a family of immigrants and we immigrated to the United States when I was four. I learned then that some people are afraid of differences. It could be your accents, it could be your foods, or it could simply just be your culture. I learned the important lesson to include everyone and value differences. I was the first in my family to go to college. I worked as an aide for children with disabilities, as a lifeguard, and I used student loans to get a BA and an MBA. I've worked for over 30 years, and I have professional experience in international supply chain management, nonprofit, and local government. I've served on the city council seven and a half years, twice elected city council president, and my professional and adult experience has taught me to value inclusive leadership. I've moved to Somerville in 1993. I felt I could fit in, and I'm grateful that my husband and I have raised our two daughters here. My vision for Somerville is a city that is equitable, inclusive, where we can all thrive together, no exception. If you share in this vision, I ask for your vote on November 2nd. Thank you. Thank you. Will Mba. Thank you. My name is Will Mba. I'm city councilor at large and candidate for mayor. I'm running for mayor of Somerville because for too long, the needs of the most marginalized in our communities have been ignored. Government is not working for them. And because it's way too hard for people to live and raise their families here. I know exactly how this feels. I'm an immigrant from Cameroon, and I know what it's like to feel like you're working hard but barely getting back. My parents both died when I was a young boy, and I was raised by my family members and in a foster home. In 2010, I was lucky enough to receive a visa to come to the United States and work. But when I came here, I saw that our government did not always work for you when you need it most. So many people in Somalia have a similar experience. Whether it be with housing or education, I've experienced these issues as well. I know what it's like to move every year because of rising rent. I know how issues of environmental justice are intertwined with issues of racial justice. There have been problems on some of these issues, but it has not happened quick enough. And until we have a government that reflects the population, how can we talk about issues like racial equity and environmental justice? 
That's why I'm running for mayor, to accelerate our community's progress on these issues and change the conversation. I have a track record that demonstrates what we can achieve if I'm elected mayor. On the city council, I led the effort to create the Office of Housing Stability because I know how it feels not to know where you're going to live. I led the fight to ban racial profiling because it was a step towards justice. And I've been there to tackle problems big and small whenever our neighbors have needed someone to fight for them. Right now, families in Somalia do not have a seat at the table, but developers and special interests on outside of our community. And I promise, if I'm elected mayor, I'll change that. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now go to our question and answer portion of the debate. Candidates have a minute to answer, and if you bring up your opponent in your answer, he or she will have 30 seconds to respond. A reminder, I'll be a stickler for time, so please stay with the limits. Uh, the first question is for both of you uh, regarding the MBTA. Will Umbach wants to make the MBTA fair free. Katiana Valentine wants to change streets to accommodate multiple ways to get around. These are big initiatives that require state funds and state approval. What specific Somerville initiatives will you put forward to make our streets accessible to all? Katiana, you first. So thank you. I'm committed to investing in safe streets. It's necessary to make Somerville a place where we can all thrive together. We need people-centric cities making streets work for those who live and work here. Eight out of 10 cars traveling on the roads of Somerville pass through. They do not stop at a business. They do not stop at a house. So we need to prioritize the streets for the people who live here now. Smart policy makes it so bikes, cars, and pedestrians aren't competing for the exact same streets. So I will work on making sure that our streets are available and accessible for all users, including people with disabilities. Thank you, Steve. I want to say this issue is very personal to me. When I moved to Somerville from you know, Sweden, I did not have a car. And so I spent more time commuting you know, and than visiting my friends and family. So this, and also, as a founding member of Somerville Alliance for Safe Street, I've been working you know, very hard on this issue to make sure that we have traffic calming measures in this city. I recently just even put another board order to make sure that we, we actually put uh, uh, children crossing sign in all our intersections. These are issues that we need to take seriously. When you're a senior year and you're a person with disability, you're almost invisible in this community. We need to change that. We need to invest in our community to make sure that our streets are safe. And the most people even suffering from this street safety, they are the most marginalized. Look at McDrive Highway. The same people suffering from street safety, they are the same people suffering from noise pollution. So that is what I will, I'm committed to do as mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, next question is uh, directed to you, Will. Uh, you have said that you will work to ensure that women who have shouldered the worst of the pandemic and the resources they need to return to their careers and ensure their children are taken care of. What are the specifics of that? Thank you for that question. Again, this is something that is very personal to me because I have two children and, and just this pandemic has shown just how much my wife has put enormous sacrifice, you know, in most women have, put to, have to put their career on hold because of this pandemic. So one of the things I would do is to analyze you know like the, the gender pay gap in the city to make sure that you know women are paid equal pay for equal work because right now we don't have that statistic we need to make sure that women are supported fully hire a new director for the summer empower the summer Bay women's commission to make sure that they have the resources to be able to support each other and and thrive in this pandemic this is something that we don't, we don't do that enough as a city. We don't support, and, and most of the people, the women even who have gone through this are the most marginalized. Look, one, everybody has gone through this uh, 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 pandemic, but the most marginalized are the ones that are suffering, suffering the most. So I will make sure that equal pay for equal work and support marginalized women. Thank you. Uh, Katiana, as your website says, families will need support to get their lives and children's education back on track. What are you offering that's different from your opponent? So we need to invest in girls and women. When we do that, we improve our communities for everyone. For the last 30 years, I've been working on this. During the pandemic, I helped families and women by organizing neighbors 
to get our most uh, vulnerable groceries. I've done that since the spring and to now, um, and it's ongoing. I wrote the legislative order to prioritizing women in the pandemic re uh, recovery. I've supported those in need in a guaranteed income program for single family-led households. Moving forward for families, we need to invest in girls because we have unequal funding in Somerville for all genders. Support our schools, our preschools, and after schools for our families so the families know they have a safe place for their children and where uh, kids and parents are helped alike. And provide stable housing through the Office of Housing Stability and supporting the eviction and foreclosure mor moratorium. Thank you. Uh, next question is for you, Will. Uh, you say that you will add additional community gardens and green space throughout the city. Uh, we only have 4.1 square miles in some of them. Where are you going to put it? Thank you, Steve, for that question. I have to even say, just to put it to scale, there are 800 house, it houses per square mile in the city. So, yes, you know, it's one of the most densest cities in New England. But I will say, you know, we, the, the demand for green space is absolutely necessary and we will improvise because we need green groups. We need to start to change how we think about, you know, our spaces. How do we, you know, like uh, take like vacant properties, create the affordable housing and then provide green space also in those positions so that, and also to make sure that low income community also have access to these green spaces. So even now when you are trying to create um, with new construction development, even at the roof, you can also like create community gardens there. Every time we have an opportunity, developers as they are trying to build new development, green space will be an integral part of the community benefit agreement that I'll be demanding that they, 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 they provide to the community. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, if elected, a progressive Ballantyne administration may be the first to face a council dominated by democratic socialists. What's the one issue where that will be an advantage to your time as mayor? Okay. So, I believe that we all want to genuinely care about our neighbors. We want to make sure that they have housing. We want to make sure that they have living wages. We want to be sure that they have education. So I believe that um, we want to take care of our neighbors. So I think that that's an advantage because I've been working for 30 years to have an inclusive, uh, I have an inclusive leadership. Uh, I've worked on equity. And uh, I think those are similarities that we carry forward together. So we will be able to add more progressive initiatives in some of them. Uh, this question is for both of you. Uh, Will, you said uh, that you use police budget to create an unarmed response team for mental health emergencies. Katiana is much less specific, stating that you want to reform police policy to ensure that we meet our goal of safety for all our residents. So what do you cut from the police budget to make that work? Katiana. So thank you. First thing, what we need to do is connect Somerville residents with the care that they need, such as mental health and social services. Here in Somerville, we've done a lot. Uh, we've reduced the police budget responsibly. We've hired a director of racial and social justice. We have created a department of racial and social justice. We have charged that department with reimagining the police considering and establishing civilian oversight commissions, which was deemed a, a priority of the Human Rights Commission 21 years ago. But there's more to do. What do we need to do? We need to make sure that all voices are at the table. The people who are most affected uh, should be included in developing the policies and not just the loudest ones. Thank you, Steve. Again, this is a question that is personal to me. As the only person of color on the city council, one of the only, somebody who has been racially profiled by the police, you know, I led the effort to ban racial profiling and also uh, led the effort to create the civilian oversight board to hold the police department accountable. I would say, right now, you don't need somebody with a gun to go treat somebody who is mentally ill. You don't need somebody with a gun to go treat somebody who is homeless. Those are things that 
police didn't have no business at the construction site. We need to revisit some of their contracts. That is how you kind of like divert. You don't need any police in the schools because the schools are meant for guidance counselors. We need to reallocate those resources. And it, they themselves have spoken to a bunch of them. They don't, they say, well, I don't want to go address a homeless person. Somebody that is equipped to do that should go do that. That is what I, I'm committed to doing as mayor in transforming our community because I've experienced these issues personally. Next question is to both of you. Uh, membership in a labor union is often considered one of the best ways to achieve good paying jobs, decent benefits, and job security. However, in Somerville, city management routinely violates contracts and members say they don't feel respected. Uh, the current mayor has not advocated for union jobs and has looked the other way on local employers engaged in wage theft. Uh, the question, if elected mayor, how would you repair the city's relationship with its municipal employees and what would you do differently from the previous administration? What would you do to improve labor standards and increase union membership in some of them? Thank you, Steve. Again, this is also something that is personal to me. I came into this country. One of my first job as a custodian at MIT, I was a member of 32 BG. I know the, the benefits of union. They protect workers. They protect families. Right now, at my state job, I'm a member of MOSES, Massachusetts Organization of State Engineers and Scientists. I know the benefit of union, so I will empower and enforce a wage theft ordinance. Only you know, contract with employees that encourage their workers to be to do to to unionize. You know, and, and ensure that there's project level agreement in every you know like contract that will be happening in the city as far as development is concerned. That's what I'm committed to do because this is how you empower your community. You empower your municipal employees to thrive. Thank you. Katia. Thank you. Uh, I've been working for 30 years on the same things the unions value. I've been working uh, to get people living wages, health insurance, education, job training, uh, access to career ladders opportunity, uh, economic mobility. I did that work in, in Boston in my nonprofit work. And I personally know firsthand the impact that unions have. Uh, when I was 11 years old, my mother was um, diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer and only had health insurance because her union fought for her. Uh, she was diagnosed and six months later, they wanted to take the health insurance away from her. So everyone deserves these, these basic rights. I am known for my inclusive leadership. I'm known for bringing people to the table. And as I've demonstrated uh, in my time on the city council, I've been the only one who's hosted a labor forum so that uh, union members can hear about development projects coming in so they can have their uh, living wages and their health insurance benefits. Thank you. Uh, this is a, next question is to both of you. This question is from the Somerville Chamber of Commerce. Somerville has 80,000 residents a $200 million plus budget, 2,000 plus employees. When you look at the scale of this job, what has prepared you for this? Katia. So thank you. So I have been working for 30 years. I've worked in international supply chain management and business for a dozen years. I've worked in startup organizations. I've also worked in the nonprofit world working in economic development for an affordable housing developer, uh, creating um, skills training, career ladder opportunities, looking, uh, also working to create green economy jobs and energy efficiency. And I've led a violence prevention nonprofit for at-risk girls. Uh, I have skills and experience in managing budgets, um, setting up strategic plans, reminding people that the strategic plans are leading us to uh, be able to uh, develop our um, the programs that we need in order to execute on those visionary plans. Thank you. Uh, well, same question, but uh, what has prepared you for this job? Thank you, Steve. I want to say uh, I'm a proponent you know, of supporting a small business. And we've done that, you know, ever since the pandemic started on the city council. I want to be clear that, you know, I am not opposed to development, but development that doesn't protect our residents and small businesses, 
Maybe this is not where you want to do your business. You want to become developed because that is what I would do, use every tool in my power to create a community benefit agreement and a community impact report. Empower community, give power back to the community because they are the ones that will, you know, will elect one of us to the mayor's office. How can you not empower them and say, you know, we are at the epicenter of development right now. So how can you empower communities you know, who are the small businesses and residents are the heart and soul of the city. How can you protect them, you know, in this phase of development in the city? That is what I'm committed to do. Um, it's now time for the second part of our debate where the candidates you mix it up a little bit. Uh, they're going to be posing questions to each other. Uh, each may take a minute to ask the question and the other will take a minute to answer. Katiana, you will get to ask the first question. Well, I was proud to work together on the plastic ban ordinance with you. What is one other thing we've worked on together to make Somerville more progressive that you are proud of? I want to say the plastic, thank you for the question, Pedro, by the way. The plastic ban ordinance was, you know, the, the tip of the iceberg. This, I have spent my entire professional life and career fighting for the environment. And right now in the city, I have been endorsed by a climate action group called Sunrise Movement because they have seen me as the only person who is capable of using his skills and expertise and his background in environmental science to combat climate change in our city. So there's a, a bunch of ordinances that will work together I cannot enumerate all of those youth, so we've probably taken similar positions throughout the entire council, but I have committed my entire career in solving environmental crisis problems. Okay. Will, you get to pose a question now to Katiana. Katiana, you said, you've mentioned several times in this introduction that you value inclusivity. But on our city council meeting on March 11, you voted against extending the period of time allowed for candidates to gather the signatures they need to get on the ballot. This was after you had tried to run for mayor and would have allowed more first-time candidates to participate in our city's elections. Why did you vote to make it harder for candidates to qualify for the ballot in the midst of a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic? Um, thank you for the question. I, uh, I have to be honest, I don't really remember uh, that particular uh, speaking one. I uh, believe that there was probably some uh, discussion in terms of timeline and uh, how it would butt up against uh, the budget and the, uh, the budgeting time for the city. I have been known for my inclusive leadership. I have um, worked to include all our communities in particular. One of the most um, example that I could use is the Clarendon Hill. We had a $330 million project uh, that went from three stories to five, seven, and nine stories, tripled in size, and um, was approved uh, after, uh, was approved without any vote against during the ZBA meeting. And that was a three year process that included many groups. Thank you. Tatiana, a question for Will. We've talked a lot about equity this year. You chair the Committee on Equity, Genders, Families, and Vulnerable Populations. Why have you only held one meeting? Thank you for that question. I, I have had one meeting because most of the issues in the pandemic, equity issues were the, the, the front and center. And so when I talked to the council president that I wanted to hold meeting, he just reminded me that we're working have all these conversations during our weekly meetings for updates of the pandemic. 
So, and we have addressed all these iniquities that this pandemic has brought to light for this past seven months together. Well, a question for Kathy Adams. Thank you. Katana, during your tenure on the city council, there has been more development or upzoning in, in East Somerville than in West Somerville, where both you and I live. Do you support more development or upzoning in West Somerville? Uh, thank you for the question. I think the Clarendon Hill is a perfect example. We actually upzoned uh, 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 Teal Square. Um, in terms of uh, the Clarendon Hill project, uh, it is surrounded by one and two family homes. Um, as I mentioned, it's a three acre plot. We've increased the density. We're going from 600 families to over 1,200 uh, families. There will be uh, three story buildings that are going to be increased to five, seven, and nine story buildings. And because I was the lead on all the um, uh, environmental and sustainability ordinance sections of the zoning overhaul, it will be a lead platinum building, certifiable, and uh, it will have native species, it will have um, additional green space, and it will be all electric. So uh, I've agreed with, with the upzoning, and again, I want to say that um, during that entire three-year process, not one person came to speak against the project during our Zoning Board of Appeals meeting, and we had four of them. Kathy, I think you pose a question to them. Women, especially women of color, have been disproportionately impacted by job losses due to COVID. Earlier this year, I proposed and co-sponsored a resolution calling on the mayor's administration to implement various measures in prior prioritizing women in our post-COVID recovery. I collected groceries every month for the last 15 months to help families during COVID, and I trialed a guarantee income program. What will you do as mayor to help address the unique economic issues that women and families face now? Thank you for that question. I just provided this answer, you know, in the, in the course of our debate about, first of all, gender parity. And I said, these were issues that were personal to me. I've seen the sacrifice that women have made in this pandemic. And they, some of them have even had to forego some their career you know, because of the pandemic, to take care of their kids and their family. So I said that one of the first things I would do is to, you know, uh, use summer staff, analyze the gender uh, uh, parity gap, equal pay for equal work, to empower women, and also empower the summer of the women's commissions, give them the tools and resources they will need to be able to, like, do their job. Hire a full-time director also as well. But, so these are the things that I, I have said it here before, and I'm glad that we are also thinking about those things together. But that is what I'm committed to do, to empower our women and our community members to be able to uh, do their, go back to work and take care of their family, even bringing universal pre-K to the city so that they don't have to stress on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Will, if you could pose a question to Katya. Thank you. So Katya, the school committee and superintendent Skipper are considering bringing police back into the schools by reinstating the school resource officers program. Do you believe police have a place in our children's schools? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, no, I don't think there should be armed police in our schools. Uh, I think the only time uh, there would be a need for that is if there was some violent issue going on that required that. I'm just going to follow up. Uh, answer your own question that you just posted, Katiana. Oh, thank you, Steve. I think police have no place in our children's schools. So we, they're both on the grid. Yes. Okay, I just wanted <laughs> to, to pop in there. Uh, for, forgive me for interrupting, Katiana. You're, you're the next thank you. Will, you have said on your website that we need a Somerville Green New Deal. We have one. I wrote it. You voted for it in September of 2019. 
Why are you saying we need a new one? Or why do we need one? Thank you for the question. I think your Green New Deal was, was a statement of values and intent. It summarizes what some of the, the, the climate forward is looking for as far as the issues are concerned. I think it was limited in scope because it has no element of the, 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 the wealth gap wasn't there, racial justice wasn't there. I did not say anything about ecology. So that is why my own new Green New Deal will be a Green New Deal written you know, by the people and for the people that are most impacted by climate change. So I'll, I'll a comment you. on that, um, I will just correct the record. If people want to go onto the city's website, you will see that it in fact is a visionary transition plan. It talks about the built environment, um, vulnerable populations. It talks about green economy jobs. It talks about what the international community is doing, what the Somerville community is doing. It is a visionary transition plan that covers everything not just one thing can i follow up okay. yeah you talk about in, in your green new deal you talk about carbon pricing isn't that you know like a, a preference of the oil and gas company um i am talking about moving away from fossil fuel um and uh the visionary plan and it's a transition plan and the climate activists in somerville have strongly been supportive of it okay yeah the same climate activists that you know in some of it like uh, uh sunrise movement have endorsed me as the only candidate that is capable to combat this climate crisis um uh, congratulations uh, on that. What I would say is I have been the lead my entire tenure on the city council. I have authored the Somerville Green New Deal. I have organized coalitions of activists, building scientists, uh, urban planners, architects to help craft the lead platinum certifiability of the zoning court. I organized um, naturalist to incorporate the green store, green score in uh, the um, zoning code. And I worked for three and a half years getting the native species ordinance through. All those things put Somerville on the map. I did that by organizing uh, the groups and uh, the rest of the state and the country understands that I put Somerville on the map as a leader. We'll talk about new questions. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. So, Katana, in 2017, you filled out a questionnaire and indicated that you would accept donations from for profit real estate developers. However, when you ran for mayor, you changed your mind and stated you will reject contribution from for profit real estate developers. Why did you flip flop on this pledge? Okay, Did you make a political calculation that you will only win this race if you reject that contribution from developers? Um, so thank you. Actually, the question said, you know, did we um, take developer money? At the time, Somerville Community Portion, Karen Nefreski, uh, had donated to my campaign. She donated to many people who said they wouldn't take money. And, uh, and I had already taken money from her, which was $25. But since they were doing a development in our ward, I was honest in how I filled out that application. It said, did you? And so I honestly said that. Um, if you will look, I have less than 1% as you have taken developer money during this campaign too. And we have both said, that we will return the money if we get that. So um, there is no um, um, dominance of developer money, certainly in my bank account. And, um, you know, I assume that maybe you haven't also returned all of your money because according to your OCPF reports, um, uh, uh, there's no indication that uh, all your developer money has been returned. You want to respond to that? Yeah, I no, I have I have refunded any developer money that I that I, I got. I don't even think that it's even less than one percent that I it's uh, every time I took a pledge 
and like when people donate, I have somebody that goes through and if there's any developer money, I've given it back. Uh, I've taken a pledge, I've done the exact same thing. So developer money is not an issue in this particular race, but you have money still on your OCPF that was donated to you on August 23rd. And I don't see that there was any indication that you've returned that. August 23rd, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. But I, uh, I have, you know, when you talk about, uh, can I continue? When you talk about that, like, you're giving, you know, money back. You know, you, you claim that you, you know, like you don't take contribution from developers, and it was discovered also on August 18 that you accepted contributions from developers, multiple developers with businesses in Somerville. So, it's, uh, I don't know if you responded to that. Uh, yes, and it's identified on the OCPF with a note that we've refunded it. But Will, you also have taken developer money in this. You have not returned it all either. But what I'm saying is, it appears that we both believe in the same thing. That we don't want large developers to have unequal access or advantages, and that we want to um, advocate for our community and our residents. Okay, now the final two questions here, uh, Katiana, would like to go to a new topic or follow up on this? Let me ask a few. This is, uh, yes, so um, Will, you've claimed that you've created the Office of Housing Stability. And it was first proposed uh, in, actually, through Somerville Community Corporation and the Affordable Housing. Uh, trust fund. Uh, and it was actually first proposed in the 2015 uh, Sustainable Neighborhoods Working Group recommendation as a housing assistance center. We all voted for it unanimously to create the office after being urged by the mayor during his inauguration on 2018, which moved our city forward. Why are you claiming that you created the Office of Housing Stability when in the community when people in the community had been working on it before you first were running for city council? Thank you for that question. When I ran for office, that was the, those, those were issues that were on my literature. So whether it appeared in some sustainable materials or stuff, something, it wasn't, it wasn't created until we got into office. And just as a point of correction, I did not say I created it. I said I led the charge because that was something I campaigned on. We came, I'm a movement candidate. So we, it, 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 I never take credit for anything, but I led the charge because that was something I ran on affordability. Affordable housing was a big issue. And I ran on that, said I will create the Office of Housing Stability. Most other city councilors that were also running that campaign that year. I came with five other uh, city councilors. We led that charge, I led that effort, and I still stand by leading that effort. Because if we were not in, in office, that would not have been created. There's so many things that are so fancy. It's written everywhere, but no, no action. Just as a response to that is, I would say, no, uh, we have slowly ticked away at that list. If you look at the recommendations that are in the Sustainable Neighborhoods Working Group list, the city council has been working on all of those. Um, so, uh, you know, even university housing was, was on there. Community land trust using DIP financing. Will, final question for Katya. Thank you. Katya. Again, this is still about real estate developer. You claim your campaign does not accept contribution from developers. So when it was discovered on August 18 that you accepted contribution from multiple developers with businesses in Somerville, you said, quote, my campaign refuses refund developer donation. The OCPA record will show the refunds when they are processed, end quote. Since then, two OCPF filing deadlines have come and gone, and records show these contributions have not been refunded. Why should voters trust you will hold developers accountable 
when you make no effort to return the contribution you receive from them? And why haven't this contribution been returned? Um, that is misinformation. The money has been returned. When someone decides to cash it is a slightly different. I'm not responsible. So it's misinformation to say that I haven't done it. We have done it. Okay, and we uh, and my campaign uh, has uh, my entire. Uh, you know what? I'm the only city councilor on this stage that has negotiated with uh, developers. In you haven't hosted a community meeting. You haven't worked with uh, developers on the on the redevelopment of the Powder House School with the Clarendon Hill project. It's 340 million. It's a complex project, state-owned, uh, public-private partnership. And uh, I have a 17-point uh, uh, letter of, uh, of, of, uh, of issues that need to be uh, addressed. There's no displacement. They get um, high quality housing, a new intersection, um, um, uh, a lead platinum, native species, more park space, two community rooms. And yes, I was integral in negotiating that. And I've made people's lives better because I've legislated for this. We're getting towards the end of the debate, so now it's time for each of you to give a two-minute closing statement. Thank you so much to the Media Center uh, for setting up this great forum, to Somerville Theater for hosting us. Will, thank you for the great conversation <laughs> and the debate. And Steve, thank you for moderating. Our next mayor must have three key qualities to do the job we expect and deserve. A commitment to our values and culture an inclusive leadership style rooted in transparency and engagement, a proven experience to be chief executive of our dynamic city. I'm running because I best bring these three key qualities to the mayor's office. I have proudly supported and enacted progressive policy solutions addressing affordability, the environment, transportation, responsible development, and many issues according to our shared values. Many of these we have talked about tonight. I have not only made sure that the voices of our many active residents are heard, but I've worked to listen to the voices of our neighbors who can't always attend our meetings. I have built coalitions, accomplished policy changes as a professional, as a community leader, and as a city councilor. Serving in local government is a rewarding passion. And for me, it is more than an occupation. I love being able to work together to accomplish positive change. Local government is where the rhetoric, all this talk, becomes the policy and the realities of our lives. Right now, Somerville is in a pivotal time as the city chooses new leadership. We will need experienced, progressive, inclusive leadership more than ever. That is what I believe is at stake in this election that is the leadership I've shown for many years, and that is why I'm running for mayor. I ask for your support in the month to come and for your vote on November 2nd. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, and uh, everybody also. Thank you to my guest, uh, it was a great debate. I want to say, only in summer day is my story possible. Only here could an immigrant who knew no one be embraced by a community of strangers, start a family, and get elected to the city council. But right now, the story is out of reach for too many. If I was to move here today, I don't know if I'll be able to stay here and live the American dream that I have. That's why I'm running for mayor, not just to ensure that my story remains possible for the next generation of immigrants, but to ensure that residents that have lived here for generations can stay here. And that children can also stay here as well. If we are going to be a progressive city, we strive to be. We need to put people and businesses that make our great city ahead of developers. Special interests who seek to profit from their own expense. That's why I'm committed to doing. I'll end by saying this. 
Like many immigrants, I have an accent. Some of you might even have trouble understanding me. But as you have seen here tonight, my vision for Summer Bay is crystal clear. I hope to end your vote on November 2nd. And thank you. God bless this city and God bless this country. Thank you both. That wraps up all the time we have for tonight's debate. I'd like to thank you both for, for taking part, sticking to the, the time, and, and, uh, and being a good sports. I really appreciate that. Um, also want to thank the uh, Somerville Media Center, uh, the Somerville Chamber of Commerce, and especially the Somerville Theater for hosting us here tonight. I wish we could have an audience, but obviously, uh, given the times, we have to do it this way. This has been a production of the Somerville Media Center with the Somerville Chamber of Commerce. I'm Steve Brown from WBUR. Thank you, and thank you to the candidates, and good night.